Right, we now come to the urgent question. Where's streeting? Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care if he will make a statement on the impact of the junior doctor strikes and what steps he is taking to prevent further strike action in the NHS. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I am grateful to the Honourable Member for his question. And turning to the first part of that question. We will not have uh, firm figures on the number of patient appointments postponed until later today because the NHS guidance has been to allow trusts a full working day to collate the data on those impacts. We do know from the three, previous three-day strike that 175,000 hospital appointments were disrupted and 28,000 staff were off, and an initial estimate that 285,000 appointments and procedures would be rescheduled, but it's premature to set out the full impact of the junior doctor strike until we have that data. But I'm happy, Mr Speaker, uh, to commit to providing an update for the House in a written ministerial statement tomorrow. Uh, and I'll also, in the coming days, update the House on the very significant progress that has been made on the successful action taken over recent months to clear significant numbers of 78-week waits which resulted from the COVID pandemic. Mr Speaker, it is regrettable that the BMA Junior Doctors Committee chose the period immediately after Easter to cause maximum disruption, extending their strike to 96 hours and asking their members not to inform hospitals whether they intended to strike, making contingency planning much more difficult. And Mr Speaker, let me put on record my huge thanks to all those NHS staff, including nurses and consultants, who stepped up to provide cover for patients last week. I recognise that there are significant pressures on junior doctors, both from the period of the pandemic and from dealing with the backlogs that has caused. And I do want to see a deal that increases junior doctors' pay and a deal that fixes many of the non-pay frustrations that they articulate. But the Junior Doctors Committee co-chairs have still not indicated that they will move substantially from their 35 per cent pay demand which is not affordable and, indeed, not supported by the bench opposite. Mr Speaker, turning to the second part of his question on the steps we're taking to prevent further strike action in the NHS, we have negotiated a deal with the NHS Staff Council. It is an offer we arrived at together through constructive and meaningful negotiations, and one on which people are still voting, with a decision of the NHS Staff Council currently due on the 2nd of May, and on which the largest union, Unison, has voted in favour by a margin of 74 per cent in favour. So we have agreed a process with the trade unions, which I am keen to respect, and we should now allow the other trade unions to complete their ballot ahead of that NHS Staff Council on the 2nd of May. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, for granting this urgent question. I mean, finally, the invisible man appears. He was largely absent last week during the most disruptive strikes in NHS history, almost as invisible as the Prime Minister, who previously said he doesn't want to, and I quote, get in the middle of these disputes. What an abdication of leadership during a national crisis. An estimated 350,000 patients had appointments and operations cancelled last week, in addition to the hundreds of thousands already affected by previous rounds of actions. And having failed to prevent nurses and ambulance workers striking, the government is repeating the same mistakes all over again by refusing talks with junior doctors. Patients can't afford to lose more days to strike. The NHS can't afford more days lost to strikes. Staff can't afford more days lost to strikes. So isn't it time for him to swallow his pride, admit he has failed, and bring ACAS in to mediate an end to the junior doctor's strike? And Mr Speaker, last week also saw the RCN announce new strike dates with no derogations and a new ballot. What does he plan to do to avert the evident risks to patient safety? Government sources briefed yesterday that they are prepared to, and I quote, tough it out. Well, that's easy for them to say. Would the Secretary of State look cancer patients in the eye while they wait for life-saving treatment and tell them to tough it out, because they are the ones who will pay the price for his failed approach? Finally, Mr Speaker, 
Writing in The Sun on Sunday, the Secretary of State for Health said he is worried about patient safety but offered no plan to get this resolved. He is not a commentator. He is nominally the Secretary of State for Health with the power and responsibility to put an end to these strikes. So when is he going to put his toys back in the pram, stop blaming NHS staff, sit down with junior doctors and negotiate a fair resolution to this terrible, damaging and unprecedented dispute? Well, oh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman seems to ignore the fact that we have actually negotiated a deal with the NHS Staff Council and a deal that that Staff Council has recommended to its members. And indeed, the largest health union has voted in favour. Uh, indeed, it is his own Absolutely. health union that has voted in favour of this deal, and yet he seems to suggest we should tear it up, uh, even though other trade unions are still voting in, re in response to that uh, offer, uh, and their leadership had recommended it. Um, secondly, he says we should sit down uh, and negotiate. We have actually made an offer of 10.75% for last year, which compared to the Labour government in Wales, where they've offered just 7.75%. So the offer actually in cash terms in England is higher than the offer that has been put on the table by the Welsh government, uh, which I presume he supports. Uh, he says he doesn't support the junior doctors in their ask for 35%, uh, and nor does the leadership uh, there, and we need to see meaningful movement from the junior doctors. But I recognise that junior doctors have been under significant pay uh, pressure uh, and workforce pressure, and that's why we want to sit down uh, with them. The bottom line, Mr. Speaker, is the deal on the table is reasonable and fair. It means that for a band five nurse at the top of the band, just over £5,000 across last year and this year uh, that will be paid. Uh, the RCN recommended this deal to their own members, uh, and it was rejected by just under a third of their overall uh, membership. And I think it's hugely disappointing that the RCN have chosen not to wait for the other trade unions to complete their ballot, not to wait for the NHS Staff Council, of which they are a member, to meet to give their view on the, the deal. They've chosen to preempt that, not only with the strikes that come before that decision of the NHS Staff Council, but they've chosen to do so by removing the derogations, the exemptions that apply to key care, uh, including uh, emergency care, uh, which is a risk to patient safety. Mr Speaker, trade unions are continuing to vote on this deal, and the deal on the table is both fair and reasonable, including just over £5,000 across last year and this year for nurses at the top of Band 5. It has been accepted by the largest union in the NHS, including, as I say, the Shadow Health Secretary's own trade union, and it pays more in cash to AFC members than the deal on the table from the Labour government in Wales. And it is a deal that the majority of the NHS Staff Council, including the RCN's own leadership, recommended to their members. We have always worked in good faith to end the disruption these strikes have caused, and we will continue to do so. But it is right to respect the agreement that we have reached with the NHS Staff Council and to await their decision that is due uh, in the coming weeks.